Good morning, and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Ouskerson, one of your hosts for today. Today we're doing a 10 a.m. Uh, on the East Coast time due to the AICPA Engage Conference, uh, which is occurring and will be kicking off today at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We appreciate being with you. We always learn a lot uh, through your questions and we'll get into it right now. So let's first uh, cover some housekeeping items. Uh, I think most of you are familiar uh, with the platform that we're leveraging. Uh, you can earn C CPE. Uh, you just need to respond to 75% of these pop-ups. We encourage you to turn everything else off uh, on your uh, PC. Uh, that helps uh, the volume stream, the, the streaming of, uh, of the video and the volume. And you also have this toolbar at the bottom, and at the end, you can click on the CPE button to get your CPE certificate, but don't worry, if you don't receive it then, uh, you will receive an email uh, post-event, and you also have the ability to download materials and to ask questions. Let me now introduce uh, today's presenters. I'm Eric Ouskerson, uh, the president and CEO of CPA.com, the AICPA's business and technology subsidiary. Uh, with, with me is Mark Koziel, who's been on every single uh, town hall. He leads uh, the firm area for the AICPA. We also have Mark Peterson uh, joining us this week. He leads the advocacy area uh, for the AICPA, and I, I think in some ways he's going to be uh, the star of today's uh, webinar because there's a lot going on uh, in Washington right now. And then we also have Lisa Simpson with us, who's been with us every week and does such an excellent job of reviewing uh, the latest guidance and has been building, her, Lisa and her team have been building all of these tools uh, for the firms related uh, to these different business uh, relief programs such as PPP. So let's talk a little bit about uh, today's agenda. Um, our, it's our standard format. We're gonna talk at a high level uh, about uh, some of the most recent SBA and, and Treasury announcements but what I want to do now is just pause for a moment and just kind of tell you how we go about this process uh, on a weekly basis. What we do is we bring you our best available information. Uh, we work hard at doing that. We're co connecting with the different stakeholders, be that the government official, be that the government, that the government officials, the SBA and Treasury, uh, the payroll providers, uh, the, the lenders, and we assimilate that information and share it with you. About a month ago, uh, we talked a lot about how the FAQs were going to be coming out in the coming days, and they still have not come out. What we're going to be sharing with you today is that there's reasons behind that. Uh, and at this point, uh, we don't think the FAQs are going to come out this week or even next week, and we'll be getting into the reasons uh, behind that shortly. Uh, but what we're going to do now is just look back at some of the past town halls and also share with you uh, the top FAQs. So with that, Lisa. Thanks, Mark. Um, so what we try to do is just give you a little summary of the prior town halls in case you weren't able to join us or in case you're wondering, you know, I know they talked about um, this particular topic, but I don't remember when. So here's your overview of what we've covered in previous town halls for the last uh, looks like five weeks is on here. So we had an in-depth conversation about employee retention credit last week. Got a, a great conversation with Ron Baker about firm pricing strategy. And then you'll see the others from there. If you missed one where we went into um, kind of a, a deeper dive into loan forgiveness, because we're not going to talk about that today, you can um, get the link. So we reviewed it in on July 9th or April 1st and also the 25th. So lots of coverage of those loan forgiveness details. You can catch the replays and of course, um, catch up on, on what you missed there. And we always like to give you a look at what some of our frequently asked questions are so that you can easily go find the answer in the FAQs that are in your materials today. So you'll see the FAQ number there to make it easy for you to find. We've added a few because these are some of the, the favorites that keep coming in on the, the back side of the Q&A. So we've got some FAQs to call out for you around 
um, FTE reductions and the FTE safe harbor. So look at FAQs 18 and 19 if you've got questions about that. If you still don't see the answer to your question, then you can submit it into the Q&A, but do check that out first. And um, if you um, don't download it today, you can always find a link to them at AICPA.org slash SBA. Hi, uh, so Lisa, now here's the questions that we're still trying to get answers to, and it looks like we're going to have to wait a, a little bit longer. Yeah, we'll keep waiting on these. If this is one of your questions, we do not know. We do not have a definitive answer for you yet, unfortunately. Um, so know that it's on our radar. This is not everything that's on our radar, but um, these are some of the top questions that we get that unfortunately we're, just, we're gonna have to wait a little bit longer. Uh, the last question on there is the status of legislation around deductibility of the expenses paid with PPP funds and Mark Peterson, our um, star of the show today is going to give you some insights on where that legislation is heading. Well, thanks, Lisa, and look forward to coming back to you shortly. So we've shown this slide uh, for the past couple of weeks, and what I want to do is just to reflect a little bit on what the current climate is around, you know, information and 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 where things are going. It actually feels a little bit like late April when we were trying to get, there was lots of discussions in DC about updated legislation around the, the loan process and there still hadn't been, uh, all, all of the guidance had not come out. We're, we're kind of in that stage right now. Even though we have 95% of the guidance related to the forgiveness process, we've got the forms, we've got the number of FAQs on them, we've got the IFRs, we don't have all the information. And then on top of that, we have the CARES 2.0 bill that Mark Peterson will be discussing. So we've got a lot going on. Uh, there's probably a lot of questions that your clients have. And what, what we're gonna do today is, is talk about directionally where we see these things are, are going. And I think that directional information should be enough, should be enough for you to have those discussions uh, with your clients, and it's okay. It's okay that you're not going to be able to apply for forgiveness right now. Uh, we'll we'll kind of give you a refresher on the blog that we put out uh, about 10 days ago. So that's where we stand right now. And then also looking out a little further uh, over the next 100 days, there's going to be so much opportunity to continue to build on the relationships with your clients, and this is going to continue to be a defining time and over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the importance of, you know, reviewing business models uh, with uh, Gene Marks. We talked about thinking about things like additional financing options, some clients needing to take advantage of things like bankruptcy or take advantage of some M&A or opportunities to buy inventory at discount. So there's just so much opportunity related to your trusted advisor role. I'm sharing a slide now that we talk a lot about at at other events, at Digital CPA. Actually, we shared it yesterday uh, during an Engage keynote. And what I want to highlight here is just the importance of the broader ecosystem, and it is increasing. I mean, the, the, the these companies are changing the practice of accounting. They actually are playing a huge role today for the firms as they deliver services. They've been very active over the past 100 days. I've had numerous discussions uh, with executives at these different companies. Uh, there's, there's some significant growth occurring, but what they're working on is just helping firms deliver the services, um, working on their onboarding, uh, their training programs, and all of them are very focused on uh, providing services related to specific verticals. So I just want to bring that to your attention. Potentially in, in a future town hall, we may bring a, a panel of some of these uh, technology executives together, and they will discuss what they're seeing with the acceleration of the adoption of their services. We've got two articles here that, that we're highlighting. One is related to concerns that policymakers have and others have related to this automatic forgiveness concept 
and that that could create situations of fraud. So there is a active dialogue going on in DC around automatic forgiveness, making it a more simplified process uh, to, to get the loan forgiven. And then there's also the, the concerns around just the checks and balances. And that, that is something that is gonna really drive the, the eventual outcome. The other element, uh, the other article that's highlighted here is about um, some of the tools that are coming out. And we're gonna be talking about the tool that we've launched. Uh, we built a tool based on the AICPA forgiveness calculator with the FinTech provider, biz to credit uh, Lisa is gonna be giving you a quick overview of that. And we actually think these tools need to be taken into account with the final decisions that are being made in Washington related to what is the best uh, forgiveness process. So let's just do a quick look at uh, the latest numbers and then we're going to get into the, the Washington update. Uh, not much has changed here. And, and, and once again, uh, the total loan amount is flat and we know there's been some sorting out of the data uh, by, by SBA. A lot of funding still left. Uh, we are aware that businesses continue to apply and we know that that funding is going to be leveraged uh, in PPP2. So, Mark Peterson, uh, you've got a lot to talk about today, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over to you and, and let you just clear uh, what you're seeing, and then Mark Cozy and I are going to probably jump in and, and have a little bit of dialogue on what this means for the firms and their clients. So, welcome, Mark. Thank you. Sure. Happy to do that, Eric. So, um, what I want to do is kind of give you a state of play, but I'm going to also start it out with a slight disclaimer. This is, this is live action reporting. So a lot of the negotiations that I'm gonna discuss are going on right now. So the situation is incredibly dynamic. So I wanna talk you through the proposals a little bit. I wanna talk you through you know, what we see as the most likely process and then some, some, um, some environment around the process and then hopefully a timeline. The, the, the delay of the FAQs, one of the issues with the FAQs is with this legislation pending, that will definitely, I'm just reiterating what Eric teed up, will, will affect the PPP program. You can see them getting caught in the gravity of these larger is, issues around, you know, further guidance around PPP and also a second round. Um, I'm going to get into the automatic forgiveness discussion and then um, talk about what we think this next package is going to look like. So just to take you back to May, because this is, it's really considered a negotiation. Um, the House of Representatives passed what they called the HEROES Act, or it would be, you know, the version phase four or CARES two, whatever you want to call it. But basically it is the House version of what's next. This was a partisan exercise, uh, so it was really a, um, a Democrat, House Democrat proposal. There were, I think, maybe one Republican that voted for it. That's not a surprise. Um, if, you know, the Republicans had the majority, it would have been a Republican proposal. Three trillion dollars, a lot of money for state and local, um, you know, deductibility for PPP was in there. Uh, uh, 501c6 was in there. Um, liability reform was not in there. Um, basically, this was the, the opening round in the negotiation. The Senate Democrats have said that this is their starting position. So keep in mind, you know, $3 trillion and a real focus on state and local. Then we move into what has just come out. And literally, uh, this was exposed to the leadership on the Republican side in the Senate Monday night, was exposed to the senators Tuesday at their policy lunch. We started to see a response from, um, you know, the Republican senators and then also uh, a response from, from the Democrats basically reiterating their starting point was the previous $3 trillion proposal I showed you. Uh, focus on liability. Um, some state, some view that there would be some state and local funding. I'm going to get into some details on that. Um, 
an expansion of, of the unemployment benefits that are going to be running out on in at the end of this month, which I think is is going to be an important catalyst. A second round on PPP. So what we have now is no legislative language, but we have summaries of proposals that are rolling out. So as I go through this, I know everyone's going to be starved for details, um, which we just don't have now. And I have to tell you that I think as this plays out, they're going to be negotiating through summaries. There's going to be a lack of a lot of details until they actually get to something that they can put on the House and Senate floor that can, can go to the president. But just a little about this proposal. We hey, did start to see some. Yep. Yeah, there's a bunch of questions coming in, so I just, uh, just let me just kind of throw a couple of them at you here. I mean, there's things like, is full forgiveness of PPP loans in the new stimulus package? Uh, what I just read in the New York Times that uh, the, the payroll, um, you know, re removal of the payroll tax will not be included. So a couple of comments here, a lot of flux, a lot of flux uh, right now occurring. Yep. There's not going to be complete PPP uh, loan forgiveness. We guarantee that some level uh, there's going to be a forgiveness process. It's a question of where where is that automatic forgiveness line. But, Mark, just lots of questions coming in, and I think what we're trying to continue to tell uh, everybody is that we're now in this foggy period, a period of uncertainty, and it won't be clear, right, Mark, until – uh, the president signs the bill. I mean, it's it's it, or or they 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 passed the bill and it's on the way to the president's desk. It, it it won't be crystal clear. It is getting slightly clearer. So let me let me talk you through the summary because I do have more details that we've gotten, um, and I'll get into PPP, Eric, uh, for the group. So we we are seeing liability reform that's showing up, um, and I think that that will definitely make it into the final package. Um, they are currently trying to figure out unemployment benefits because I mentioned it ran out. Uh, the Republican package is talking about something less than a $600 supplement. Um, I'm gonna come back to that related to timing. We are seeing some tax provisions, no details, but things like uh, enhanced employee retention, some Im Im economic impact payments, 100% business deductibility, workplace tax credits, Related to PPE, personal protection, testing and cleaning, uh, and, and several other provisions as well. Um, PPP, we're pretty confident there's going to be a PPP2. Um, they're talking about another $90 billion being put into that program uh, on top of whatever is left when the program runs out on August 8th. Um, what we're Seeing and hearing is that it will be very much targeted to businesses with less than 300 employees or who have lost 50% of, um, of revenue uh, would have the ability to go back for a second loan. So very targeted. Also hearing uh, Senator Rubio, who is the chair of the Small Business Committee in the Senate, also talked about you know, highly impacted communities. So second round PPP, but think about it being much more targeted. And then, Eric, as you pointed out on the forgiveness side, we are hearing uh, through the summaries that are coming out, streamlining the forgiveness level at $150,000 and lower for PPP loans, and then some type of um, intermediate forgiveness for a million dollars or lower. I know that's going to generate a lot of questions about what's intermediate forgiveness, but something less than, you know, the certification, um, but but not as much as um, – you know, something more than certification, but not as much as going to be would be required. You know, as currently proposed. Um, and then they're also Mark, focusing on, on farmers, that. ranchers. So on the automatic, I mean, people are saying, what are the odds of it happening at 150,000? And then the other other element is, will there still be some forms that are needed to be submitted? And uh, there's in this bill here, in some ways, the automatic forgiveness is about the lenders not having, the lenders just accepting the certification on the business owner's side. But right. the current understanding, there's still going to be something submitted by the borrower to get the automatic forgiveness. So that will be, and maybe there'll be different yeah. levels of information. Yes. I think it's different levels of information. I think the 150, again, think of this as a negotiation. 
That's the proposal. I don't think it will go up. I think it, it, it will either hold at 150 or go lower because of the points you made earlier, Eric, on fraud. The so other thing, and I know that we have work for the firms with get, even the automatic, there's still could, not a lot of work. There'll be work with the borrower inputting some information, and that will sort that out because this, this could be, there still could be information provided. Uh, the borrower certifies that, and then the lender accepts that, and that's, that's what we're going to be kind of sorting through in, in the next couple of weeks. Absolutely, and, and I think that the Again, we're working off not legislative language, but summaries, but the focus is on streamlining. Um, and so there is some level of certification and some submissions that have to be made. The other question was on deductibility. We have not seen it yet in the Republican proposal, but I will tell you, I still believe it's going to happen. Uh, there's bipartisan, bicameral House and Senate support for that. Um, and so we do believe that we're going to see it in the final package. Um, and that's another one that we're going to be following closely. I will um, go to just real quickly, Eric. Um, Monday, we submitted a letter because we knew they were going into this kind of next stage of the negotiation. We focused on the things that we, we know are important to the profession, full deductibility of PPP, uh, simple simplification of the application process, which we've been talking about on all these town halls. Uh, an issue we've been working on for many years related to mobile workforce, which is actually a de minimis standard for state income tax withholding if you're working out of your home state. This would be focused on, you know, during the period of emergency declarations, uh, help from the nonprofits, the 501c6s, some level of state and local government relief because of the impact on small business and the profession and then liability protections in order to be supportive of, of companies getting up and running. So Eric, so are, are there other highlights that you're seeing you'd like me to hit? Yeah, I mean, right now, so just, let's just a summary comment. Then we're gonna come back in, in open forum. There'll be, there'll be more questions. But so you, the timing here, and so yeah. I'm going to ask you to predict, you know, the, the timing. So right now, I mean, even today, you know, in, in, the, in CNBC this morning, you had Mnuchin, you had uh, Mar Congressman Hoyer, everybody talking about, you know, what's the process. Everyone's saying should, using that word should, and the, the media is saying, well, will it happen and, and when will it happen? So why don't you, you know, uh, shed some perspective on that? Right, right. And again, dynamic situation and in a much more political situation than the first round of CARES, where the, 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 they were working closer together, uh, both sides of the aisle, House and Senate, in order to get a package out early uh, in, in this crisis. Um, we're closer to the election, and that environment has changed. So even this Republican proposal that rolled out the last 48 hours there is not a consensus among the Republican senators that this package is calibrated correctly, that it is, you know, too, sm too small, too big, where the focus is. Um, and so, you know, they're going to have to work through that just on the Republican Senate side. So I'm, what, what I'm portraying for you is complexity. The Senate and, and the House are supposed to be going out on recess August 8th. One would think that they would get this package done by then. I think that that will be their goal. Um, however, I could also see it leak into later uh, into the fall. Um, I could put together a scenario where I mentioned um, the unemployment uh, benefit. They, there's possibility they could deal with a, a short-term fix to that. That takes away that July 31st deadline, takes a little pressure off, of you know getting this done by August 8th. So your, your comment on the word should is absolutely right. Uh, I think they're gonna talk about that. They're gonna put pressure on each other to get a deal by then. But I gotta tell you, uh, it's very possible and there are scenarios where this leaks into later this fall. The other thing I will say, Eric, is that this is gonna be another big package. It's gonna happen. I think the question is, is where, what is the end product? It's going to be something between that $3 trillion 
uh, proposal from the House Democrats and the $1 trillion proposal from the Senate Republicans. It's going to happen. It's going to, it's just win. And it's going to be somewhere between the two of there. That's going to happen before the election. I think it's very possible. I would put in the likely column that we get into post-election. Uh, we get into next year when a new Congress is sworn in. They're going to be back at uh, figuring out recovery. And so the packages might not be in the multiple, no, multiple trillions of dollars. Um, but even after this package, I think that we're going to be talking about you know, business relief and a real role for the profession, um, you know, well into next year. Well, Mark, great summary there. We're going to come back to you during open forum. I mean, real quickly here, as Mark just said, you know, something is going to happen. It could be early August, could be September. There will be uh, changes to the current PPP program around automatic, the, what's the automatic forgiveness level, there will be a PPP2 with uh, certain criteria for eligibility, things we've been discussing, and it's going to be somewhere between $1 trillion and $3 trillion. So, uh, Mark, I think we'll be having you back uh, in August uh, and look forward to continuing the discussion in open forum. So, Mark Koziel, want to bring you in. Um, we got – there's some questions that still come in right now, and I, I said, you know, I've just been saying FAQs, but someone said – we, I heard the the SBA was issuing 25 to 30 FAQs. You and I have been stating that, so why don't you, for some people, just state it one more time again and then just go into a few of these uh, guidance slides. We, thanks, Eric. Yeah, and we, we have talked about that in, in uh, the last number. Lisa mentioned it up front about the <clears throat> questions, the common questions that we get that we already have guidance out on. Uh, and so that was in the first couple of slides. Go back to this slide deck just to double check that. Other common questions that come in that we say uh, we believe are going to be addressed in these FAQs. 25 to 30 FAQs, yes, we've said that in the past. SBA has said it, Treasury has said it. Uh, they have them uh, generally uh, from what we know, but they're just not going to release them. And you know, it, the timing may be earlier, but with what Mark Peterson just went through in, in great detail, and I got to tell you, our D.C. team has been on top of this. I had emails coming in the middle of the night from our D.C. team as they've been in the hallways, at the bars, wherever they can find folks from uh, the D.C. legislative teams to get this information. And so while it's not final, or permanent, it is a lot of the discussion. And I think it's important to understand how much of that discussion takes place before these things do become final. There are a lot of rumors. We don't know and uh, you know, we don't uh, have great percentages on where everything's going to go final. But because of all that ambiguity, no matter what FAQs that Treasury and SBA have today, uh, a lot of that's going to change. When 80, if the 150,000 number sticks, and that all loans under 150000 become forgiven, that's 86% of the program. For a lot of our small firms, they're going to get incredibly great relief. And so we have said, be patient. And I know that's hard. And I've had, I even posted about PPP on my personal Facebook feed last week. And I had a, a friend from high school say, yeah, but, you know, I've been waiting and I'm just anxious. And he's got his own small business. He's doing his PPP loan by himself. And he says, I just want to get this monkey off my back. That's exactly what he said to me. So, you know, we understand that your clients have great anxiety over this. And, uh, you know, the, the blog post, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute, uh, was issued by Lisa Simpson on AICPA's website and has had over 60,000 views to date. And it's only a couple weeks old. Uh, so a lot of people have been using that. And, and it is. And hopefully, and I understand clients keep calling and, and are, are really anxious, but the more we can over-communicate up front, maybe it's through an email blast to our clients, giving them the blog post, saying that you are on top of it. However, look at all of this other ambiguity that's going to get pumped into the system that's really driving a, a lot of this. And you see the second uh, key item here 
is the automatic automatic forgiveness. And so, you know, that is really kind of holding it up because if that happens, you know, even the August 8th extension, by the way, uh, they SBA and Treasury have not yet updated the forgiveness application they originally issued for any of the calculations affected by the August 8th extension because your safe harbors out to 1231 would now actually extend beyond that. And so they've held off on making any changes because of all these conversations. So we all have to be as patient as possible, communicate to our clients. Eric, if you go to the next slide. The, uh, as, as we go ahead. Mark, Eric. right now we're on the loan forgiveness uh, application landscape, the blog slide. I just wanna let everybody know, you sometimes have to refresh your browser if the slides are not advancing. And then we've also had some questions about getting the alerts. We've, if you're asking a question during when alerts going out, it, it, you don't get the alert, but we, we send another alert. So don't worry, everyone's gonna get their CPE. Uh, so Mark, back, back to you and you're on the, uh, the, the blog slide. And thank you for that friendly reminder to me to refresh my screen, even though it was working right up until that point in time. Uh, anyway, so the loan forgiveness app, you know, the application landscape. I do think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the blog post you see there in the little iPad on the right, five reasons borrowers shouldn't rush their PPP forgiveness application. Now imagine if your client under 150,000 qualified for the eight weeks and you went through this forgiveness application and all of that gets done, uh, even though no one can accept it right now, and you got it sitting on your desk, and then a month from now, that gets automatically forgiven, how are you going to get paid for that work? Or how are you even going to talk to your client about doing it? So we just don't want to see our member firms go through a lot of busy work gyrations when, uh, you know, there's still changes to this program coming. So we do need more guidance. We are you know, Eric asked me the question when we were offline about, uh, you know, where are we in the game? Are we, you know, in the third quarter, fourth quarter? I mean, we're looking at, you know, there's only a small portion of the forgiveness uh, application criteria that needs to be answered, but they're critical answers. So getting that information and getting to the next point is going to be vitally important. And as far as you know, where we are in the game, you know, my only reply was we're on an indefinite rain delay uh, until we can get back up and running and do some work for our clients. And then if we get to the next slide. And as we look and as we go forward, yep, as we look and as we go forward, uh, you know, the, the forgiveness uh, calculator that we've had uh, you know, we, we, as Lisa had talked about, uh, we have we have provided this in great detail how to go through the calculation. There is an Excel version that we have available as part of this. We're saying again, don't be in a rush to go out and start calculating that for all your clients. But this became an important tool for what we are about to talk about. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, whose team has just done just incredible work around this. And she could talk more about the Excel version and then move us into the next steps. Lisa? Yeah. And Lisa, let me just kick this off a little bit just before you, before you, you get into it. And what we have done here is built with biz to credit this complete integrated solution. And there are a number of tools that are coming out in the marketplace. And this is important. What we're trying to do here is help drive this common approach and where we're at right now is that technology uh, platforms have had the time to support the process here. Back in April, uh, there, it was not possible to have a platform, but now there's going to be a platform that will assist you and assist your clients in going through these steps. So, Lisa? Thank you, Eric. Um, a couple of comments about the AICPA Excel spreadsheet. It is available out there if you want to do some scenario planning, um, just play around with the numbers. We're also working on um, a fillable PDF version that you can um, play around with as well. We'll keep reiterating the point. Patience is a virtue right now while we get all of the details worked out. 
and um, our team has been doing some QA testing on the back end for the forgiveness tool.com, PPP forgiveness tool.com um, tool that you see on the screen there. It's really pretty cool if you haven't um, had a chance to look at it yet because it is um, going to ask for the borrower information as far as the number of um, whether it's a pay by weekly, bi weekly, semi monthly. And then it'll tell you if you're eligible based on your um, loan date, if you're eligible for the eight weeks, or if you need to stick with the 24 weeks because you got your loan after June 5th. It will, um, once you get in and start putting in the payroll information, it's going to automatically calculate out the um, salary and hourly wage reduction, and any, uh, and it'll base that on the amount of the um, covered period that you selected. So did you select eight weeks versus 24 weeks? So all of that is built in and it's all gonna dynamically um, filter through to actually complete the um, Form 3508. It's gonna ask you questions about um, whether or not the EZ is going to be the process for you, uh, if you've met those requirements. Then um, if you're using the um, CPA module, it will allow you to send out to the client to um, get the information to access their payroll data. All of the supporting documentation can be uploaded. Then you're gonna get a, a really cool option to electronically sign the application itself and create the entire package that can then go to the lender. The uh, Lisa, CPA portal that is- thing. Yep. Because right now we're on the app, the borrower application uh, portion uh, slide, and we have these two videos. Just to let everyone know, these are clickable links, uh, so you can and downloadable materials. You have this slide, and there's their bar, there's a borrower demo video which walks you through everything that Lisa just described. And then in a minute, we're going to show you the CPA client module, and then we've developed a four-minute video for that as well. Yeah, and for the, uh, for the consumer version, for the borrower version, it, it, we're trying to use as plain English as, as we can, given the complexity of the calculations, there's help text built in, and um, we're also working on with our coalition of payroll providers and with some lenders that we're having conversations with. The item number three there around uploading documents, we're working to establish a consistent set of documents that will be requested from the lenders. It's at least what we're going to propose that they accept. And we've mentioned in the past that we're working with payroll providers. They're diligently working to develop PPP forgiveness compliant reports that the borrowers or their CPAs have access to. And if those reports can be simply uploaded to this platform, they'll be included in the package for the lender to review. And then if, um, if the SBA decides to review that particular loan, it'll be available for them as well. So the, the goal here is to um, you know, make this a, a more efficient process and try to reduce some of the complexity. For the CPA um, portal, this will allow CPAs to act, um, manage the applications of their clients that have gotten the PPP money. So they will go through a similar process with um, the ability to um, upload the payroll data. Then once it's all entered and the calculations are performed, the CPA can send it to the client. The client can review the application and electronically sign it, including all of the various certifications that are required on the, um, on the second page of the application. That will come back to the CPA, and then um, the CPA can produce the final PDF that can then be submitted to the lender. Again, as Eric mentioned, there is a, a link to the CPA firm demonstration video up there, and I'd highly encourage you to Check that out. And we'll, again, patience, right? So once it's all worked out and 
We've gotten all the final guidance that we need to answer those lingering questions around how to calculate the um, salary reduction in detail. We will make adjustments if needed to the calculator, and um, we'll also be hosting a webcast to take a deeper dive into that platform. Lisa, we've got a couple of questions coming in. I'm going to help, help, help answer them. One is, how will this, you know, link in uh, to lender platforms? So there's a, one question was about a large national bank, one of the top three banks. What we're hearing right now is that this is all something, the lenders are all working through how they're going to build out their platforms, how they're going to be uh, managing the forgiveness application process. There is some discussion that they they will be taking a, a signed signed PDF and and then putting it into their systems. And there's clearly going to be uh, some banks that are standing up uh, platforms uh, where you'll be in, inputting information. Well, how we see this is uh, is this could be a check and balance. This this CPA console tool will allow you to organize all of your clients that might be at multiple banks. Uh, to put the information in, to then have a, a downloadable file which will have the 30, the 3508 or 3508EZ uh, form filled out, the electronic signature on it, and then any related source document, and you'll have that all in a in a complete package. We've talked to some firms that are that are trialing this, and they're saying they will use this as as I said, somewhat of a check and balance. There may be some banks that decide to take this, this file and then leverage this file. There may be other banks uh, that have, a, that have a, an online platform. So once again, these are things that we're just going to continue to uh, think through, uh, talk to the stakeholders about, and we're, we're, we're glad that we have a platform that's at this state right now. We will be doing overviews on this platform. And and that's 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 what I would I would say is wait for either an an overview that will be scheduled for sometime in in early August, or if you just want to get a quick look at it, watch the videos, and if you want a little bit deeper look at it, you can actually go uh, to uh, the site pbbforgivenesstool.com and and register, and then you could you could actually uh, load up some information and and start utilizing it. Uh, as Lisa and, and we've all been stating, we don't think you should be filling out a, uh, a, a, a doing all the work or forgiveness application today, but you may want to just experience the capabilities here. So Lisa, Mark, anything else that you want to add to that before we uh, we move on? Um, I think we're good. Thanks. And we look forward to just kind of continuing that discussion uh, with the broader payroll community, the broader lender community, try to drive a common approach. And one other thing that we'll let you know is it's our understanding that the SBA still does not have the, the, uh, the, the applications set up, uh, the feed set up to receive the file today from the lender community. So there's two things that are preventing any forgiveness applications being done. One, the guidance, the final guidance isn't out. And two, uh, it's not possible per our understanding for the SBA to receive uh, the, the forgiveness application. So here's the broader relief options that are available to businesses. We've been talking about this every week. We talked a lot about PPP, but we also stepped back and we talked about with, with Mark Peterson here, uh, we should start labeling the far right-hand column uh, CARES 2.0, because additional relief programs, we've been saying they're coming, they are coming. Uh, you actually heard from Mark, there's going to be, there'll be CARES 2.0, and, and then towards the end of the year, good chance of a post-election uh, additional relief bill. So lots of options here. We talked about employee retention credits last week, uh, so that's, uh, that you can leverage that video file if you want to watch uh, uh, details related to that program. We also have a, a webinar coming up on that. Lisa, Mark, anything you want to highlight on, on this broad slide? The only thing I'll say, Eric, is on the Main Street lending. Um, again, it's an option that's available. There were 
uh, deep concerns, but there started to be a little bit of movement this week on it. So uh, it may be something to consider. At least anything on that uh, that you've seen? I think you're exactly right. Lots of concern. Um, we have a Journal of Accountancy article that talks about the expansion into nonprofit lending within that Main Street lending program. So I'm, I'm sure you can do a quick Google search and, and find that excellent JVA article if that is something that will be relevant for you. As a reminder, we talked about this, um, I think, a, a week or two ago. It's, it's Blur's Day again, but um, the EIDL program, the $10,000, up to $10,000 in emergency grants, that money has run out, but the program, the EIDL loan program, is still um, advancing loans. We just got a great um, statement from one of the, the attendees stating uh, they've had several clients get EIDL's, uh, EIDL loans submitted and approved and funded within seven to 10 days. So thank you. Thanks for that input. That's great. And we did talk a little bit last week about the employee retention credit. Um, later in the slides, you'll see a link to a, a very deep dive that is going on next week, June, July 29th. Lots of opportunity for your clients within that ERC um, vehicle. So check out that webcast and, and get a deeper dive. Well, Lisa, I'm going to give you a minute. Let's uh, go to open forum here. Lots of questions coming in. Yeah, so we'll, let's start that off. And one thing I'll, I'll highlight is things are happening so fast. I actually uh, saw Twitter's CFO this morning uh, give a, a short talk, and he stated that their users are up 50 million over the past quarter, 35% growth. And social media is, a, is an effective way to communicate what's going on in this, in this fast-moving time. So we have been doing that. We've been sharing uh, the latest, if it's about our, our forgiveness tools, if it's about information uh, from, from Treasury to SBA, I encourage you uh, to follow, follow our tri Twitter handles here because as soon as something comes out, uh, we're getting it out through those social mechanisms as well as LinkedIn. So, Lisa, let me go to you to start asking a couple of, uh, of the hot questions. I'm going to, um, this is going to sound a, a little disjointed because we're going to jump around a little bit, but we're getting some questions about the pppforgivenesstool.com and whether or not that is open only to um, CPAs or whether the general public can utilize that tool. Eric, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Just like the calculator, the AICPA Forgiveness Calculator, the AICPA Loan Amount Calculator, those were free tools available to firms and to borrowers. Uh, the same concept for the, the, the platform. The platform is available to borrowers and it's available uh, to CPA firms. The CPA firms can sign up and uh, set up a, a, a CPA client console where they then can upload uh, their client's information, and then they have the ability to send it to their client uh, for their signatures and review. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite powerful platform, which one, yes, a borrower can directly utilize it, uh, or the firm can utilize it and uh, support uh, getting the information up on behalf of their client and then having the client uh, uh, review and do the e-signatures, and then the firm would get that package and, and they could provide it to their client. Thank you, Eric. We had a question earlier on. Um, we talked about the fact that the FAQs had been delayed, but there was a question about whether or not, um, and, and Mark, I'll direct this one at you, uh, Mark Cozio, I'm sorry whether or not we expect revised forgiveness applications as well. Do you think that's um, part of the challenge in getting the FAQs? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think that they have to, right? So, uh, you know, first of all, if 86% of the loans are going to be forgiven automatically, uh, that needs to be reflected in the, in the forgiveness application. In addition to whatever changes get made based on this August 8th extension and whether or not this, uh, you know, Mark Peterson talked about this quote unquote ex additional extension of PPP, 
where they're going to have additional limit, limitations and, and the like, you know, they're probably going to want uh, some level of a forgiveness application to apply to all of this. So, uh, you know, it, it is definitely being held up for what's going on in Congress today. Thank you. We got a question um, that that I'll actually answer, and then you guys can um, add in if if you want to. We got a question about some banks are encouraging their clients to apply for forgiveness, saying that they are ex accepting applications for forgiveness currently. And um, the attendee is asking, should we recommend that they wait or go ahead and file? My response to that would be that if it is a very straightforward um, eight week, excuse me, eight week borrower, no FTE reductions, no salary and hourly uh, wage reductions that you're unsure of how to calculate in, in detail, then in that scenario where it's very straightforward, all the money's been used, then if you wanna go ahead and, if the borrower wants to apply, that's fine. Uh, the bank can go ahead and, and make their determination, or the lender, excuse me, can make their determination, but they still can't submit it to the SBA currently. I don't know, Eric and Mark, if y'all have any a difference of opinion there. No, I'd agree with that. Hey, Lisa, I'll just, I know you're looking at them, the, the questions are just, and these questions are so helpful because we tabulate them in these drive, a lot of the resources that we put out there. Mark, I'll, I'll kind of throw this throw this to you. It's just about when you're using a tool uh, for your clients. Uh, is this something that you should you should disclose to your clients? I, I know you know right here at TPA.com we have a lot of firm solutions in place, and yes, I mean uh, you you should disclose when you're when you're leveraging tools, and and then secondly. There is this, you know, we, we, privacy is an important and security is an important element. Uh, there's a there's a SOC review that's been done on 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 the broader platform, and there is a privacy policy in place. But Mark, any comments just on, you know, the engagement letter or, or management of the client related to leveraging platforms? Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know about uh, full disclosure, and I guess the question will be, how will the client interact with that platform as you're using it? But, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, let's say, in client accounting, Eric, because, you know, your team does so much great work in that perspective. Uh, the tool at the back end shouldn't necessarily matter. So whether you decide to go with, you know, a Sage Intact, a Zero, uh, a QBO, you know, if you decide as the uh, service provider to switch tools, then so be it. Uh, so, you know, and I think you can uh, double check that with some of the the technical folks that are out there, but, you know, it is up to uh, really the firm to decide what's the best tool. Do we, well, you know, we're using tax software, we switch tax software, are we disclosing to the client that we're moving from, you know, pro system FX to something else. I, I don't think we necessarily do that on a regular basis. So my, uh, I would say probably not. And Mark, it was, I said to, for the audience here, we're going to have a, some special uh, webinars on tools, capabilities. And what I also, I should have mentioned this uh, when I answered the question about, is it available uh, just for borrowers? And one, I just got a comment in that said, hey, I'm an AISBA member in a company, and I appreciate it being available just to borrowers. And on these calls, these town halls, 25% of the attendees are in business and industry, are in, are in companies. Uh, so that's another reason why uh, this tool is available directly to borrowers, as well as having this special uh, CPA console. Hey, Eric, Lisa, it's, we probably it's have Mark time Peter. for one or two more questions. Can I, hey, it's Mark. Can I uh, make just, I, I just want to emphasize one point because the the forgiveness is coming up quite a bit. So, you know, we heard from, from Treasury Secretary Mnuchin an openness to the forgiveness, uh, auto forgiveness or streamlined forgiveness, whatever you want to call it, at a hearing recently. We absolutely have seen the 150 number show up in the package that the Senate is offering up. But I do want to caution folks, that may move. That number of 150 may not hold, and that the situation is dynamic. So 
we're, we're hearing and seeing 150, but that could change. I just wanted to emphasize that, Eric. Yeah, Mark, thanks. I just want to make a point. There was a good Forbes article that came out this week that, you know, some clients out there um, had stated that they had not applied due to the complexity of the process, and they stated with these tools uh, that potentially, you know, some businesses might still apply here in the, in the final days. You have till August 8th, August 9th. So I want to encourage uh, the firms uh, to do a final outreach. I mean, things are happening out there. Um, in, in the United States, we're all reading about them or watching them uh, occur every day. So if you've got clients that, that, that have been impacted um, and have not applied for this first phase of PPP, do it. Uh, there's lots of tools to, to support that. And then some businesses, their anxiety about the forgiveness process should decline uh, because there, there are capabilities being put in place to support that. That's a great point. So, Lisa, give you a final um, uh, question, and then we'll, we'll, or I can also just move to our to our final slides if if you think it's a good. And that's spot okay. To our, our our remaining questions are pretty detailed, so we'll use those to uh, come up with some ideas for uh, future town halls. Okay. Thank you. So, let, what what we've got a couple of uh, you know general announcements here at the end that we want to provide to you. Talk about some of our resources. One thing that we want to let you know is that we're going to share more information about this new domain.cpa uh, that's going to be launching as of September 1st. You know, the Internet's evolving. Uh, there's uh, new top-level domains. We've, we're fortunate that for the profession, we're going to have .cpa, which is going to be a restricted domain just for licensed uh, firms and licensed CPAs, enhanced security, trust, and opportunity for better branding. Uh, more to come on that, uh, and I just want we did delay this launch just due to the business relief activities and the July 15th tax deadline, but that is coming. So here's the Resource Center, which you all should be rather familiar with, um, has links to all of the old town halls, uh, also has the FAQs and, and other, other information that we've discussed uh, today. We also have a broader uh, coronavirus uh, resource center, uh, which I encourage you uh, to take advantage of. Uh, Lisa mentioned this earlier. Uh, so, Lisa, which one is this? I'm looking uh, for the ERC uh, course, Mastering the Employee Retention Credit course. That is going to be next week, Wednesday, uh, July 29th. You can click on this link or you can, you know, find information about it uh, on, the, uh, res on our resource center pages or uh, the store site. Now I want to talk about uh, uh, next week and uh, what we're going to be doing. Uh, our plan for next week is if no guidance has been released or there has not been some significant activity uh, in D.C. related to the CARES 2.0 bill, you know, our feeling is this is going to really begin to get settled in early August. So our plan right now is to have the next town hall Thursday, August 6th. On that town hall, we're, we're going to have Barry Melanson is going to be joining us. I think there's a very high likelihood that Mark Peterson will be back with us. Once again, if there is um, new guidance that comes out, what we're going to do is record a, a special town hall and make it available uh, to all of you. So that's what our plan is. And, and then the, in August, we're going to have one on August 6th and August 20th. Um, we're going to have two in August. If needed, we will absolutely schedule another town hall. We find these sessions to be extremely valuable. We greatly appreciate your feedback through the Q&A. We appreciate your feedback when you fill out uh, the surveys. So thank you very much for your time this week. Uh, we appreciate it. Mark Peterson, Mark Cozio, and Lisa, thanks to you. Thanks to the extended AICPA team uh, that puts all of this information together with us every week. Hope you all have a great day. Look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Thank you.